morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's mentoring hour, uh, this week's mentoring hour, where we spend time uh, uh, discussing, asking questions. Um, where we have uh, it's a, a gathering of our faculty and students, um, where we can ask any questions, um, and then you know, it's a it's a great time of learning, exciting. Um, yeah, we're just going to take one more minute, and then we will uh, get going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So we'll um, we'll start. <clears throat> Can I just request any of the students to pray? Maybe Ravali, Anita, anyone, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> Um, I'll pray faster. Sure, please. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you that you gave us this time to come together as we uh, go to the session, as we discuss, as we uh, hear from everybody. Jesus, we pray, God, that you uh, speak to each and every one of us. Um, you talk to our hearts directly. You answer our questions and uh, uh, give us uh, uh, your wisdom, oh, Father God, to go through all of this. Uh, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ravali. Um, today, um, we have with us Pastor Selina Makwana, and uh, she's going to take about 10 minutes to share with us about um, children's ministry, the importance of children's ministry. Pastor Selina has been involved in children's ministry for uh, many years, and uh, she's also um, uh, in charge, oversees our Catalyst initiative. So, um, yeah, we welcome Pastor Selina, and over to Pastor Selina right now. Go ahead, uh, Selina. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jay Kumar. Uh, shalom, everyone. Praise the Lord. Uh, today, I'm just going to present uh, a few points regarding the importance of uh, children's ministry. Uh, in the Bible, it is very evident that God has a plan for children, and we see this. Uh, uh, in scripture. Scripture points to us the importance God places uh, in various uh, areas of uh, children's life. And we see in scripture the importance uh, God places on teaching uh, children. Uh, in Genesis chapter 18, uh, you know, verses 17 to 19, God is speaking about Abraham and his future role. And uh, God acknowledges that he has uh, chosen Abraham uh, to become a great nation. And through him, all the nations will be blessed. And then God reveals his intention for Abraham in verse 19, in the same chapter, Genesis chapter 18, uh, verse 19. He says, you know, um, for I've chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised uh, him. So in verse 19, we see that, you know, uh, God had this intention for Abraham that he would teach his children and his household to follow the ways of the Lord, uh, practicing righteousness and uh, justice. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, we see God giving uh, Moses and Aaron instructions on how to, you know, observe the Passover. And uh, he, uh, Moses and Aaron in turn goes and calls all the elders of the community and gives them uh, these instructions, which we read in, in the same chapter of Exodus chapter 12, verses 24 to 27. We see that, uh, you know, uh, Moses is telling them, even when they go to the promised land, they are to observe uh, the Passover festival. They are to do just like they th they're going to do now in Egypt, the first Passover festival. And uh, Moses tells uh, the elders that when your children ask you, you know, what this ceremony means, uh, you need to tell them, you know, why God asked them to do this uh, and what is the significance of this uh, so that they would know the ways of the Lord, they would know how God uh, helped them, who God is, and they would know his mighty deeds and his works. Uh, so the children will be taught uh, the ways of the Lord, they will be taught the deeds of uh, God. 
we also see in Deuteronomy chapter 31 where Moses is um, 120 years old and is no longer able to lead the people of Israel and God had chosen uh, Joshua uh, to you know lead the people and so Moses is instructing uh, the people and in this chapter of Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 12 to 13 in these verses uh, Moses is telling the people that when um, they enter the promised land and you know when Israel appears before the Lord their God in the place where he chooses then they shall read the law before uh, you know all people and he says you know assemble the people and it uh, he does not just say men and women but also children are included in that and so he says you know so that they can listen and learn about the ways of the Lord their God and they'll be careful to follow everything uh, given in uh, the book of the law so and he says that their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the lord their god as long as they live in the land uh, that they are crossing the jordan to uh, possess so we see that you know the importance god places um, on teaching children the laws the commands um, and we also see this in psalm chapter 78 verses 1 to 8 where uh, it says you know uh, do not hide all of these from the children uh, tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the lord so that they would know his power and the wonders he has um, done and if we continue in the same uh, chapter uh, we also see that you know it says uh, teach the children so that the next generation would know them even the children yet to be born and they in turn would tell their children so that they would put their trust in the lord their god and they would not forget his deeds but keep his commands and they would so that why is god saying it's so important for them to uh, know the the commands to know the laws so that they can put their trust in God they would not forget his deeds what he has done and they would keep his commandments and they would uh, not be like their forefathers a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to the Lord whose spirits were not faithful to him so we see the importance God is slaying from the very beginning, right from the time of Abraham, throughout the Old Testament scripture of uh, teaching and inculcating and reading the law and letting the children know what he has done um, so that they would put their uh, trust in him and they would be careful to do uh, follow all his commandments so that they would not be stubborn and rebellious, they would not be unfaithful, but they'd be faithful to the Lord their God and they would know him and have a personal uh, relationship with him. We also see that uh, children were an integral uh, part of the corporate worship um, in um, uh, in the community of Israel. They were also an integral part of the covenantal community because we see that uh, you know uh, Abraham was to teach his children the 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 covenant promises were passed on to not only to Abraham but to his generations. And uh, so we see that children were an integral part of the covenantal community and also they were an integral part of the corporate worship that happened. So we see that the biblical pattern is for family, uh, old, young, um, uh, you know, to come together in worship, in praise, in prayer, uh, repentance, hearing uh, the reading of scripture and uh, salvation as uh, well. So if you look at um, uh, Psalms chapter 148 verses 12 to 13, uh, we see that young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. Uh, so, you know, it's not only older people who have to praise uh, the name of God but uh, and worship him, but it's also children who were, uh, uh, you know, uh, commanded or uh, required to learn to praise the name of the Lord because he alone is exalted. Even in regard to prayer, we see, uh, we read in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 12 to 13, you know, when King Jehoshaphat was faced with these three armies that were coming to fight against him. Uh, and then, you know, he uh, assembles all the people, he tells all the people to assemble uh, in the temple and to inquire the face of the Lord, to know what 
to do with this time of uh, despair and need. And he asked everyone to fast and pray. And we see that uh, we read in uh, tw verses 12 and 13 of Second Chronicles chapter 20 that, you know, um, their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Okay, so they stood there before the Lord, and uh, it was not just the older men and women, but also children who were part of this whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, faith journey of just trusting, seeking God, hearing from Him, uh, knowing what to do in this time of despair and need, um, and uh, you know, also fast and pray. So they were you taught from a very young age to inquire of the Lord, to seek His face in times of trouble. Uh, and to pray to him and uh, to hear what God has to say uh, in their uh, situation. So even the little ones were there standing, you know, uh, and uh, uh, hearing from the Lord and part of this whole exercise of just uh, seeking the Lord's face. We also see that uh, children were part of reading uh, of the law, and we uh, we looked at it uh, just a little uh, uh, before. You know, we, we looked at it in Deuteronomy chapter thirty-one, where uh, Moses tells uh, the people that when they assemble together, even children are uh, required to be there and to hear the reading uh, of the law. So, of the law, so children are also uh, were also an integral part of hearing and reading of the the law of God. We also see, read this in uh, in Ezra. We also see this in Nehemiah, when Nehemiah, you know, after he builds the walls, uh, when the the law was being read out uh, by Ezra, we have, we see that not only women and uh, men were there, but it was also the children who were uh, listening to the law and how they were repenting of their uh, sins. We also see that salvation uh, is not only, uh, you know, there is no age limit set for the gift of salvation and for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verses 28 uh, to 39, uh, we read that Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children for uh, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So, uh, you know, we think that salvation is, uh, is only for people who are uh, mature in age or maybe, you know, after their teens or in their youth, uh, uh, they're able to understand salvation, but we see uh, and receive the gift of the Spirit but um, uh, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39 that, you know, repentance, uh, salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, is also for uh, children. So when children... Um, uh, you know, uh, at the very tender age, can understand about sin, about salvation. Uh, you know, so we can teach them the importance uh, of these these two things, these two aspects, uh, these two doctrines, and also, you know, uh, they're in an age where they can receive uh, and be baptized in the Holy Spirit and receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Of course, when they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, they don't receive a junior Holy Spirit, but the same Holy Spirit that we receive as adults, they to receive, and they can be mighty uh, uh, in flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, uh, you know, and God would use them uh, mightily. We also see that, uh, you know, ministering to children was a priority for uh, Jesus. Uh, we read this in Matthew uh, chapter 19, uh, you know, when uh, when uh, parents brought their little children to Jesus to place his hands on them and pray for them, uh, the disciples rebuked them. The disciples didn't think, you know, that children should be ministered to, but uh, uh, we see the importance that Jesus gave to minister to children. You know, uh, children were so precious in Jesus' sight. He, he loves them and he wants the children to be brought to them. And uh, we read in Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as uh, these. So we see that uh, Jesus took time. He, uh, even though the disciples think, didn't think that they should be ministered to, but Jesus saw them as a priority uh, to be ministered to, and he did uh, minister uh, to them. Now, there is a season in a person's life when, you know, they're most open uh, or most receptive to uh, learning what it means uh, to trust in God. And this season is sometime between the 
ages of 4 to 14 years uh, when people uh, children are more moldable and uh, you know then they will ever be in their lifetime and during the season of life is when children are forming their understanding 4 to 14 years you know when they are forming their understanding of the world of relationships of love of God, of scripture, uh, the truth of the scripture, you know, about sin, salvation. So, and it's also a season, uh, you know, where children are easily influenced and we should be intentional about ensuring that they get the right um, uh, impression uh, and also learn the truth and also know the truth and experience the truth and have a close personal relationship with God because this is the time when they are learning about God, they uh, learning about the truth and most of their uh, moral um, basic moral foundation is also you know established during the age of uh, when a child is almost nine years old so it's uh, uh, it's very important age group between four to 14 years when you know we can uh, children are more moldable it's widely believed that more than half of the individuals who come to believe in jesus uh, do so by the age of 12 so you know, this is a good age to talk about sin and salvation. And just two more points, you know, uh, by the time a child is nine years old, their basic moral foundation has already been formed. So it's important for us, uh, you know, to provide them with strong ethical and a spiritual framework uh, early on in life where children can be grounded in the truth in God's word. They can, um, you know, which will serve as a solid foundation on which they can build their moral values and standards as they grow and develop. And just by, uh, before I close, I'd like to say that by the age of uh, 13, many children have begun to develop, uh, you know, uh, foundational beliefs concerning the nature of God, the reliability of the Bible, the concept of afterlife and love for uh, Jesus. So, you know, uh, mentioning all of these uh, points, we see that, you know, uh, ministry to children is so important uh, and hence uh, the children's ministry in our churches should be uh, strong, well-built, well-established so that children can be grounded in the truth in God's word and have a relationship with him in the very early age. Thank you, everyone. Over to Pastor Jay Kumar. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Selina. I think that was... Uh... Quite an eye opener, just to see that um, children's ministry is, is, is not an add-on or something, you know, uh, as a time filler. You know, what do we do with the children? You know, <laughs> let's tell them show stories or uh, share some coloring sheets or something like that. But it's a very intentional thing because we see right through uh, scripture that God uh, wants children to be included. Yeah, that's, um, thank you for sharing the biblical basis for children's ministry. So I just open up this time for all our students um, and faculty also. Like if you have any questions uh, for Pastor Selena uh, uh, on children's ministry, then please go ahead and share. Now I mean, ask these questions. Yeah, uh, I think I see Herbert, his hand raised up. So Herbert, you can go ahead and ask your question, please. Thank you so much, Pastor J. Kumar. And uh, I hope everyone is okay. It has been long. So my question, Ms. Pastor Serena, uh, the children say, <clears throat> I mean, you know, Matthew told us that uh, the Bible says that the let the ch little children come to me uh, for the kingdom of heaven is here, is theirs. So uh, they are, I think they should have said maybe, that the kingdom of heaven is for old people and uh, young children. I, that statement normally confuses me as if the heaven is not for old people, for adults, but only for children. Since he said that, let the little children come to me. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Herbert, for your question. I think in this context, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus was, uh, the context is about ministering to children and, you know, the disciples thinking that children should not be ministered to. But Jesus is saying that, uh, you know, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God uh, is, uh, you know, also belongs to these children. He, when he was talking about the kingdom of heaven, he was not talking about, you know, uh, about 
going to heaven, but Jesus came to inaugurate the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven when he came uh, to the earth, he uh, he inaugurated the kingdom of God. He inaugurated the kingdom of heaven. So what he was basically saying is that you know it was not only for the adults to hear uh, the good news of the gospel uh, that Jesus was teaching. It was not only for the adults to experience Jesus, his miracles, uh, his work, and to hear what he is teaching. But you know it was also for uh, children which means that the kingdom of heaven is uh, you know open to everyone to children and to adults but here specifically when jesus came he came to inaugurate the kingdom of god kingdom of heaven in our physical world in reality and so you're telling the disciples it's not just for the adults but also for children to experience the father's love to experience the works of the father uh, and to experience all about the fullness of the kingdom of god and the kingdom of heaven did that help herbert yeah, thank Anyone you so else? much. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I was wondering which uh, activities, which uh, which which can we do to entice to, to to make children love God, especially from five years to nine to nine eight eight years or nine. Yeah, which activities can we do so that we can make them love God and you know uh, grow up when they are knowing Jesus and loving God. Uh, thank you, Herbert. So uh, basically, it's about narrating uh, the story, uh, the uh, the narratives in the Bible that talk about Jesus's love uh, and what He has done for us on the cross as well. So uh, you know, uh, establishing them in these truths that God loves them. You know, just uh, uh, you know, uh, even if their friends around them or their, you know, the world around them doesn't seem uh, uh, very loving, caring, but there is someone who loves them, who uh, appreciates them, who they are precious to, who cares for them. So I think narratives in the Bible that talk about God's love is very, very important. Uh, and also, you can, uh, you know, do activities like where they can. Uh, you know, sh uh, show acts of love to others, uh, which gives children an opportunity uh, to know that they're loved by God, but it's not for them to just hold on to that love, but that love is to share with uh, others as well. So you know, taking children to, children to orphanages and uh, to old age homes and uh, uh, to ch children with special needs, with uh, homes that children care for special needs, and just showing them the love of Christ uh, also helps children to understand that love is not just for them to hold on to, but also uh, to share with others. But most importantly is to be ground, ground them uh, in the love of God uh, and what God has done for them. So once they're established in the truth, you know, uh, their activities themselves will help them to flow in God's uh, love and ask them also to open themselves to God's love. Uh, love that is to prayer and worship yes uh any thank other faculty so can add mm -hmm. yeah thank you herbert the other faculty if they want they can add to what i've said uh, if there's anyone else who wants to add um to what pastor selena shared about um, what kind of activities and i think herbert asks typically about the five-year-olds five to nine that age bracket um so how to what kind of activities will really get them uh, draw them uh, to the word and ground them um okay well we can basically move. i think uh, sorry, act yeah. activities sorry pastics uh, basically activities like you know uh, uh, playing with their friends, loving, uh, uh, loving their friends, sharing, caring, because children ages five to nine would like to have everything for themselves. But you know, just uh, giving them opportunities on how they can uh, uh, love and show care and uh, share with other friends, their classmates, their siblings, uh, can also be a good activity. Yes. Just to add to what Pastor Selena shared, um, just a practical thing which happened quite recently uh, in my house. Like I was talking to a little nephew, I think he's in, he's about six years old, 
And so I noticed that whenever we said, you know, let's pray, he'd be just running around, uh, you know, fidgeting, feeling a little uncomfortable. So just uh, asked him while we were eating, uh, having dinner, just asked him, you know, do you feel, wh why do you feel awkward or uncomfortable when we pray? You know, we are talking to Jesus anyway. And uh, that kind of opened up a whole lot of conversation. You know, he said, uh, yeah, I know we believe that Jesus, we believe in Jesus. But, um, you know, but and we believe that Jesus died for us. But uh, it seems, uh, it doesn't seem logical that he would rise again. You know, uh, how would anyone rise you know, and rise up from the dead? And he's six year old, you know. So, um, and uh, he uh, he lives in the UK. So it, it's a, he's, it goes to a society which is um, religious, but not really, faith is not a uh, you know, uh, part of everyday life. So. So he has these questions, and so engaging in that simple conversation really helped. Um, so I, I was able to tell him about, uh, you know, uh, uh, even though uh, you know his friends might be, uh, his peers might be saying, uh, might be believing other things, but you know, you know, um, you've experienced Jesus, you know, and you can be strong. You can talk to him, and there's no need to be uncomfortable. Uh, especially with people who believe differently and so on. So um, so I, I'm just saying that there could be a simple conversation around simple activities um, that would, um, you know, minister to children as well. Um, thank you. So any other uh, questions um, that you might have, um, please go ahead and put it on the chat. And also uh, you can unmute and ask about children's ministry, maybe you have children, and what is the right way to minister? It could be about um, several other things also. As parents, how do we do it? How do we, you know, how do, maybe, uh, you know, you're ministering to children, but how do we um, uh, get the help of the parents also? And, and so many other things. So whatever questions come to your mind, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so Sanjay, uh, as posted, saying music is a powerful medium. Songs based on biblical values will help them learn and grow with the truth. Very true. And these songs will remain with them. The words will remain with them as well. Thank you, Sanjay, for that. Um, so your questions uh, need not be only restricted to children's ministry. Um, yeah, okay. Here's a question from Sam. Um, Sam Matthews, has the pandemic affected the way we need to do children's ministry uh, to adapt in terms of teaching and learning styles, challenges, et cetera? So, um, Pastor Selena, if you can. Uh, thank you, Sam Daniel, for your uh, question. Uh, yes, after uh, we, uh, you know, uh, after the pandemic, when we started uh, ministering in schools, I noticed there was. Uh, huge difference and a huge change in children's mindset, the attitudes, uh, because they were so confined to the home. And basically, uh, you know, teens, um, those who in eighth, ninth and 10th grade, I realized that they were just, you know, they were, they were, you know, their be behavior was really sometimes atrocious and crazy. And I was trying to understand what is really happening uh, in their minds and why this kind of behavior, especially when it's in a co-ed school. And I realized that when, you know, uh, when they uh, left school just before when the pandemic began, they would have been in fifth and sixth grade. Now, you know, they've all grown and in eighth grade, they are all, you know, uh, teens and um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the girls seeing the guys, the guys seeing the girls, the hormonal changes, everything. There's so much of excitement. And uh, so, you know, and also they were just glued to the screen. They were not having, uh, they were not interacting much with people. So uh, uh, they uh, they were getting even more violent, some of them, the way they were even behaving with the teachers, the way they were they answering, back answering them, uh, even small children. So, you know, and they, their uh, attention span was also very, very limited because they were so used to looking at, uh, you know, graphic images just changing every uh, second because they were so glued to TV or to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, media. So realize that we need to bring in more of uh, videos, uh, PowerPoints, uh, activities, uh, more practical life examples uh, from which they can 
think, analyze, uh, you know, uh, issues that are happening around them to talk about that, uh, even when you're talking about doctrines or uh, scripture, how we need to bring in real life scenarios that they are and the challenges that they're going through, not only for teens at any age group. So now we've kind of are revising our, uh, our children's church curriculum and we're bringing in more of case scenarios where we're making it more practical for them to think, analyze and learn. Because during the pandemic, uh, you know, children were left on their own to do everything, their studies, their project work and everything. So I think we need to uh, bring in all of these changes and adapt to their mindsets and uh, to the way of thinking more of media more of practical life examples case scenarios get them to think get them to analyze because that is what is going to help them even apply god's truth god's word in their uh, everyday life yes i hope that helped and answered your question uh, sam okay, okay. Um, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sena. Um, let's move to the next question. Shiba has a question. Shiba. Um, so she asks, can we teach children about good touch and bad touch? How can we teach them? And are there any references from the Bible? So good touch and bad touch about safe physical boundaries uh, as children are growing up. So yeah, over to you, Selena. Uh, is Jean here on the call? Uh, um, no, not today. No, OK. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's uh, thank you for your uh, question, uh, Shiba Shinde. Uh, yes, it's important for us to teach children about good touch and bad touch, uh, you know, from a very early age, I think even from uh, uh, upper KG upwards, you know, it's important for us to, um, you know, teach children. And so I think schools have begun uh, teaching children about this, uh, even in, in our children's church, uh, we are bringing in, uh, you know, uh, uh, these topics uh, uh, and uh, life skills and teaching them. Uh, it's a very sensitive area, but uh, you know, we are uh, just praying about it and uh, you know, waiting on the Lord and as he leads and guides. But yes, it is important for us to teach them. Uh, references from the Bible, uh, you know, uh, can't tell you off the mind now or anyone else can help with uh, any references but uh, basically you know uh, talking about uh, uh, you know simple scriptures like you know our bodies are the temple of the living God how we need to keep ourselves holy and when Paul is writing to Timothy about uh, you know, uh, how we need to live our lives uh, how women uh, should dress and you know uh, and all of those things I think those are some of the things that have come to my mind, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't, okay, other faculty can help with some references from the Bible. Um, yeah, would, would anyone else be interested to add on to what Pastor Selena shared? Um, Maybe something. Maybe we can share yeah. later on with her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, and thank you, Susie, for that. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Sheba, right? Um, Sheba. So I hope that helped, uh, Sheba. Yeah. Okay. So um, next, we have a question from Susie. Um, it's about how people say that they receive the Lord as Savior at a young age. You know, at age five and so on. So. So her question is, is it possible to really understand and be saved at that age? Um, since she joined in a little late, um, so she just wants to know. Um, and also, uh, I, I think we addressed it uh, uh, about the biblical basis for children's ministry, Susie, like how uh, right from a young age, people are able to understand and how the word talks about the fact to include them in corporate worship, to teach them the ways of the Lord and so on. So yes, um, which means that they have a capacity to receive, they have a capacity to understand. Um, but over to Pastor Serena to specifically address this um, because there has been practical experience as well in the children's church. So um, yeah, over to Selena. 
Uh, thank you, Susie, uh, for your question. Um, so, like I just mentioned in my presentation, that there is a season in a person's life when they're most open to learning uh, what it means to trust God. And uh, so, you know, researchers in children's ministry, uh, child psychology say that the season is between the ages of 4 to 14 years when children are, you know, uh, more moldable than uh, ever in their lifetime. So, and during this season, children are forming their understanding Understanding about uh, the world, relationship, and the love of God. And uh, uh, children the age of five, basically, you know, they love stories on uh, creation. They love stories about how God created the world, also about, uh, you know, various narratives about the love of God. So even as we're talking about the love of God, you know, we can, uh, they're also able to understand at the age of five what is right, what is wrong. Uh, so yes, you know, they can know what is right, what is wrong. And uh, they can understand uh, salvation, not in, in a very broad sense, but uh, that, you know, uh, Jesus loves them and, uh, you know, that he uh, wants them, to, he saves them from sin. What They know the consequences of their sin because they know that when they do something wrong, they get punished. You know, their parents punish them. Uh, it's it's uh, something that their parents will scold them. And you can just talk about uh, in, a, in their uh, little understanding about how, you know, uh, God loves them and how uh, sin kind of destroys their life brings in punishment and shame because they understand that and how uh, Jesus came to save them uh, from this. So yes, children at the age of five uh, have accepted uh, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I know children in grade one and two who have uh, prayed the salvation prayer as well. Uh, so, and you know, from age of four, four to 14, they're very moldable, they can uh, understand, yes. Because at the age of nine, children, uh, their basic moral foundation has already been formed. So it's important for us to teach them and impart the truths in God's word. And it's the Holy Spirit that works in their uh, lives. So the Holy Spirit is, you know, uh, can work across any age group. He can just speak to them. He can mold them and uh, impart into their lives and, you know, uh, uh, you know, and they can receive Jesus in their very early age. Yes. Thank you, uh, Pastor Singh. Um, Susie, hope that helps. And just a personal testimony, you know, uh, when my daughter was around five, 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 between five and six is when she received the Lord as Lord and Savior. She accepted the Lord. And it was in a school uh, during the morning assembly when someone shared the gospel in very simple terms, the fact that um, we need a Savior and, uh, you know, what is sin and uh, and so on. And so, um, so in a way, she understood and uh, she was uh, when she she prayed the prayer, and obviously something happened because uh, when when we reach out in faith and when we receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells us, and uh, you know He He witnesses to our heart. So she came home uh, very excited that uh, evening, and the first thing she told us was that uh, you know today there was a prayer and there was an invitation to receive Jesus, and I did that, and she was very excited, and from that day on that. Kind of stayed with her, and uh, she, you know, so so they will grow in faith, grow in their understanding of what salvation is, you know, justification, sanctification, etc. But um, this truth of the simple truth of receiving Jesus and experiencing Jesus, Lord and Savior, uh, at that age group, yes, they are able to uh, understand. Thank you. Okay, we have another question from um, from Esther uh, Clement, and um, her. Her question is this, you know, for teenagers between 16 and 19, it's a sensitive age. Um, they are choosing professional courses and so on. And they feel that they are big, too big for children's church, uh, Sunday school, and too young to be part of youth. So how can parents help in this transition? So I'm assuming that the church does not have anything to minister to that age group. So how can parents help in this transition? Some practical insight. Um, um, Selina, you want to share? Um, you know, yeah. I also, yeah, uh, once you share, you can then, go ahead and share and go ahead and share, Pastor Jake. We can also ask Sam if he has any inputs to add on, then I can also share something. Okay, um, uh, can I just uh, ask a few things? Yes. Um, so, 
so usually at this age, right, when they kind of, you know, once they cross 13 or 12, say, the, the real, uh, the, the, our whole approach to working with children should change. Uh, you know, up to age 12, you know, we tell them, do this, don't do this. It's more of an instructional thing. Um, but then when, you know, 13, uh, the whole dynamic changes, they're asking questions why. Um, they want to reason, they want to understand, rather than just follow. Um, and so the church also needs to change how it ministers to that age group. So, uh, for example, at APC, only recently we, we started teen church. So that means they're saying, okay, we, we recognize that we have this, exactly like what you said, uh, Esther, that there is this age group, you know, they're, they're, they're older than the children, but they're younger than the young adults. Uh, so they're in between. And so we need to minister to them differently. Uh, and, 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 you know, their, their body is evolving faster than their brain. Uh, the brain is yet to catch up with the, uh, the changes in the body. And so there's, there's this whole inner conflict itself that they're experiencing because they're trying to reconcile all of those changes. Um, so uh, the approach we should take is more to reason, explain, uh, and if they understand why, then they will definitely do that, rather than just saying, do this because I told you so. You know, do this because I told you so works till age 12. 13 on is, here's how it, you know, here's why we do it, and we explain. Um, then I think uh, um, also in, in terms, if I, you know, if I move from the church setting to the home setting, I think the big thing is that uh, as parents, we should be involved in the lives of our children. You know, um, um, the sad thing is many of us parents delegate everything, you know, when they go to school, education is delegated to the teachers, they come home, homework, we send them for tuition, so tuition work is delegated to the, you know, tuition teacher, uh, and basically the parent doesn't even know what's happening in the life of the child, our parents don't even, are not even involved, uh, and then there is this big disconnect that develops, especially during that 13 to 18 year period, and then you know, you try to catch up in their twenties. It's too late. the The gulf has, you know, developed into something big. So I think, uh, from the church perspective, the church should also address it uh, in a very specific way. At home, parents should be more involved in the lives of the children. You know, for, especially from thirteen on. You know, getting them to understand. You know, what what they need to do for education. How what are their skills? Helping them discover their uniqueness, their individual skills. Uh, contributing to the nurturing of those skills to be really involved uh, as opposed to be disconnected. So that's very important between uh, ages 16 to 19. And that kind of leads into what Daniel's, you know, Daniel Oliver's question is, you know, do we beat the children or, you know, and the teenagers, do we beat them or not? Yes, there is a certain amount of, you know, uh, physical discipline that can be done, but more than physical discipline, it's the, the, the relationship that matters. Children are going to listen to you because they believe that they see that you are invest, invested in their lives, that you believe in them, you care for them. There's that relationship. Uh, if that relationship is not there, you know, no, no amount of beating is going to change them. You know, they'll just say, hey, yeah, you, you know, it's like the child who says, I'm sitting down outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. So it's, it's like there's a complete disconnect. So the answer again to Daniel Oliver is uh, we can essentially do away with beating if we are able to reason with them. You know, I'm not saying you know, that, that physical discipline uh, uh, is not important, uh, but that can be slowly phased out completely uh, if we are able to connect with them intellectually and then also spiritually. So I think um, uh, this calls for a lot of involvement from the side of the parents to be very meaningfully involved. And I always, um, you know, in my own learning, I, I, I always look at it like this. If I, if my children can see that I really care about them, then they will get interested in things that, care, that I care about. But if I don't care about the things that they care about, they will not bother about things that I care about. You know, so it's a reciprocal relationship which has to be built in very tangible ways. Okay, that's my thought, thank you. Thank you, Basta. I think that was that was good. Thank you, Esther, Daniel, for those questions, and uh, I think they've been sufficiently answered. Um, any other question? Any further questions? 
think we might have time for maybe two more questions uh, before we close. So um, any pressing questions that you might have? Uh, Okay, um, yes, Sister Natasha, you could, yeah, you can ask your question. Uh, you can, yeah. sir, uh, good morning, everyone. It's not regarding the question that we are discussing, the topic we are discussing. Uh, as you know, I'm an e-learner, and I want to keep uh, up with the lessons that are going on. But unfortunately, the videos don't get posted uh, in a day or two. I mean, almost last week, I hardly found any videos posted on the college website. They get posted on YouTube, though. But if I watch on YouTube, then I have to watch again to be able to say that, yes, I have done the lesson, you know. So just wanted to know about that. Is it normal for me to be a week or two late or how is it? Yeah, Pastor Nancy. Uh, yeah. I, I think... Um, um, yeah, uh, that's our, our fault. So uh, we have to improve things on our side. Uh, the videos do become available, uh, you know, towards the end of the day, they do become available. Um, uh, and yes, for the e-learning, you have to watch it in e-learning because it tracks your progress. But I think uh, all of us as faculty need to be a little bit more, um, uh, what to say, uh, more, uh, you know, just to be more prompt in posting it online so um starting with me uh, i was late last week so starting with me i will um, i will just remind all of our faculty to post it uh, the same day uh, the plan is to post it by 5 p.m the same day so i just request everyone to do that so i apologize for last week and hopefully from this week uh, we'll all be back on schedule but thank you for raising that up thank you pastor Pastor, thank you for answering Natasha's question. A very quick uh, um, addition. Uh, Natasha also wanted to share that uh, once the faculty has posted the videos, um, the students on e-learning have to completely view the video for them to be able to view the content that is ahead. Uh, sometimes what happens is that if the students do not uh, complete uh, viewing the entire video and then uh, complete some of the knowledge checks that may be uh, posted by the faculty uh, the uh, content ahead doesn't get unlocked so that's another uh, matter to bear in mind uh, but this is when the faculty has already posted all the videos and the content so just wanted to share that as well um, uh, so that it's helpful for all our e-learning e students thank you thank you pastor thank you um, pastor nancy any um any further questions um, maybe we can take one last question before we wind up for today a anything on children's ministry or anything else as well uh, please go ahead and share um so yeah go ahead sister natasha uh, while we were talking on the importance of children's ministry and we said different things about what to do, but the importance of children seeing the same qualities in parents more than talking, you know, because I think my children see us do things and that has helped them more. Because if they don't see what we are teaching, then don't see it in us. That does more harm than good. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions, uh, Sister Natasha? Um, or did you just want to share that? Or... We take it for granted that parents are doing that, but I think everyone should be reminded that uh, I hope we are doing the same thing that we are teaching the children. Right. OK. OK. Um, so I just wanted to ask, uh, Pastor Selina, I don't know if people are thinking about the same thing, but um, you know, how do I know that I'm called for children's ministry? Um, say I think very quickly we have about maybe a minute but uh, if you can just share one thing you know how do I know that I'm called for children's ministry I think uh, uh, you you have the gifts to the gift uh, to function in that calling uh, you have the skill the talent to function in that calling and then uh, you have a heart and a burden for children 
uh, and sensitive to their needs and you know you just uh, uh, so for me I didn't know I was going to be full-time in children's ministry but I loved children from a very young age you know, I loved them even when I was very small I loved children so uh, it was God just actually you know orchestrating those things in my life to see so to say uh, you know to function in the role that he is calling me and I also see that he's given me the gifts to enable me to fulfill that function yes Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we will pray and close. Thank you all for joining. Let's uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, time in your presence, in your word. We thank you for all these questions. We thank you for these discussions, for all these answers, Lord. And uh, Lord, we pray that you'll continue to enhance our learning and, uh, and draw them, Lord, draw each one of us, Lord, to you, Father God. Um, I pray that um, you'll go from strength to strength and glory to glory. We come at this day, all the classes into your mighty hands. Uh, continue to speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Pastor Selena. And thank you, all faculty, for answering the questions. God bless. Bye-bye.